Good evening, uh, and welcome to those who have joined us here in person. Uh, here in New York City, and to those who have, uh, uh, who have joined us online. Uh, my name is Megan Scowry, and I'm the senior librarian at the American Jewish Historical Society. Um, our thanks to the Yibo Institute for Jewish Research and New Lair House, our co-sponsors. We're all so pleased to bring you this wonderful event this evening. Uh, Deborah Dash Moore has been a longtime supporter and friend of AJHS, and it is our honor to have her here with us to discuss her latest book, Walkers in the City, Jewish Street Photographers of Mid-Century New York. Also with us tonight to join the discussion is Manhattan Borough Historian Robert W. Snyder. Thank you for being with us. It's such a pleasure to have you. Following the discussion, we will then have a Q&A where we invite audience questions. At check-in, you were prompted to take a white note card, so please write any questions you might have right on there. And my colleague Janine, give a little wave. And I will be collecting the cards about halfway through the program to be given to Robert. And so when you see her or me in the aisle holding up the white note cards, that's your prompt to pass your note card down to us and we'll collect them. Uh, after the program, we'll have a brief reception and book signing up in the Great Hall. Um, and if you didn't place a pre-order, we do have some books available for purchase. Now, without further ado, please welcome author Deborah Dash Moore and Robert W. Snyder. Thank you. Thank you. you know, you've written about so many aspects of Jewish history and urban history. So how did you choose to write about street photographers, Jewish street photographers, in New York City in the middle of the 20th century? So the book actually began, oh gosh, I mean the idea for the book began um, over 20 years ago. Um, I published a book called Cityscapes, uh, a History of New York and Images, and I was responsible for the second half of the book, so post-Civil War. And so I uh, was decided that I'm gonna use photographs. I, I could have used lots of images, but I was gonna use photographs. And we didn't have any money for permissions, <laughs> you know? So we had like $25, we were asking photographers, will you let us publish your photograph, for 20, which was very little money. Um, and some photographers said, you know, you must be kidding. <laughs> the book doesn't look like a low budget production. No, no it does, okay. But others said, um, where'd you see my work? And I would say, well, a Museum of the City of New York, New York Public Library, and you know, et cetera. And they'd say, oh, well, that's just a fragment of it, right? Um, come, come to my studio, and you'll really see. Uh, I have a lot more stuff. So I did. I went to studios, one after another, around, I mean, near Union Square, there was one guy uh, down the Lower East Side. I, I mean, I, I went around the city. Um, and s gradually, it dawned on me that I was seeing one Jewish photographer after another Jewish photographer after another Jewish, and that they were all these Jewish photographers who had incredible work. Um, and they were right, it was only a small piece of it. And so that really was the sort of kernel of the idea. And you know, I worked with Mac, my, my husband, and we published an article way back in 2004 that was sort of experimental on thinking about Jews and, and photographers. Um, he is a photographer and I am not, so he knows what it's like to walk the streets of New York carrying a camera. Um, I just look at the photos and then he said, no, you do it, you know, and so I, it had to be New York because I knew New York and I was learning about photography from all of these photographers. So that's, that's sort of how it, it began and it took a while. Yeah. Before we look at some of the photos from the book, what had to happen in New York City in Jewish life and the history of photography to set the stage for this? Yes, that, that's important. So the book really begins in the middle of the Great Depression. I, um, with the founding of something called the New York uh, Photo League. And it's two Jewish guys who meet at City College, right? So this is, the, this is the Jewish New York story. 
they meet at City College, they try an experiment with a, a magazine that they, they publish, but they both want to do photography. And so they go down to the predecessor organization, um, which was the New York Film and Photo League, and that group has been in the process of splitting. So they, they join, but they join the, the photo part, the photographers, not the filmmakers, and then they want, um, they, they want ordinary folks to be able to be also taking pictures, right? Not just the professionals. Um, and so there's a meeting, and one of the guys, Sid Grossman, is very persuasive, and he convinces the people that there was a vote, you, it should be um, open to amateurs, workers as they called them, because right? they were left wing. Uh, it should be open to workers uh, and not just for professionals. And the professionals were annoyed and they left. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, you get this mix of, these are, these are Jews who are born to immigrant parents, they grow up in the city, they essentially create this New York Photo League. Um, it, they start making a, a school because, again, they want workers to, to learn how to photograph. And it's also a time when photography is becoming much bigger, right? I mean, Life magazine also starts in 36, as does Look, and, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a moment of burgeoning interest. It's a field that's open to anyone, right? And I think you'll remember that a, a bunch of the photographers I talk about are high school kids. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. When they get involved, um, it, so it's really that's that's the sort of Jewish New York left wing connection that becomes so important. Yeah. And the. The cameras they could use as well. These are not they, cameras that require tripods or anything like they that. They don't. They don't. But uh, um, they they getting they're getting smaller. But some of them are, are they're still pretty big. Um, you know, it's not this. It's not this kind of camera. Right. It, it's this kind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. or like a Rolleiflex where you're you're looking down, and that has a certain advantage because. You know, I can look at you, right, um, like that, but really be taking a picture of you, <laughs> right? Um, and th that's one of the things that the camera was was good for, and so it was much lighter and much much more flexible. Yeah. Now, there's two big traditions in New York City photography. One is the skyline and monumental right. buildings from the top down. These photographers are all from the bottom up, so not only look yeah, at some of these yeah, pictures. Yeah. Let's look. Okay. So, so this is a great. Um, shot of uh, by a, a very well-known photographer, Bernice Abbott. She is an out-of-towner, if we're going to use New York language. Um, <laughs> she comes to New York um, right after World War I. Uh, she thinks it's great, and then she leaves and she goes to Paris. And she, you know, works with Man Ray in Paris and stuff. And she comes back in 29, and it's like, wow, the city has really changed. Um, and she uh, it decides, she proposes, this is federally supported money, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? She proposes to do a, a changing New York. And she uses tripod and she uses large format camera. And this is the garment district, right? Because the garment district has now moved up to 7th Avenue. It's no longer down on Broadway where it was, or on the Lower East Side, when she first came to the city. And this is a sort of typical kind of photo that you would see of New York. The skyline, um, looking down, the people are really tiny. Um, you know, you can see they don't have traffic lights. Um, <laughs> Right? Uh, yet, <laughs> and stuff, and you know, it, it's, it, it, you can't tell what the garment district is like, right, there, from this view from the, the Nelson building. All right, but. You, you write, I want to just quote this back okay. to you, because I think it's lovely. A photograph grants each viewer a license to stare, to contemplate, and to respond. 
potentially intrigued, annoyed, sympathetic, judgmental, even moved to action. Why did this matter to these young photographers? Ah, I think it was their way of coming to understand their city and their place in the city, right? They were New Yorkers. They grew up in the Bronx or they grew up in Brooklyn and they, they, they wanted to um, understand the city and the, the camera was this opportunity because it was a chance also to share what it was that they saw. They, they, they didn't, you know, they didn't take photographs just for themselves and they didn't take photographs just, you know, professionally. They, they often went back to the places that they were taking pictures of, right? They took pictures on the Lower East Side or whatever, they'd go back and they'd hand out prints. Uh, because, so there was a, a reciprocal relationship that they wanted oh. to establish there. Um, so should we take a look Let, at that? Sweet uh, Evelyn, uh, okay, yes. Okay, okay. Because... Sweet Evelyn, okay. So Sweet Evelyn is a really good example. Um, this is by Morris Engel. Um, he was a teenager when he took it. <laughs> Um, and he discovers the Photo League as a teenager, and he starts taking pictures around the city. Now, this is New York City. You don't need the skyscrapers to know that it's New York, right? I mean, you're all sitting here in New York, you know. He's going down the subway steps, right? That's New York. The uh, eyes examined, right? Those kind of signs, that's New York. Um, he's looking at her, and the, New York is a city where people look at other people, right? I'm sure you know that, right? And you also know that if you have the license to stare, right, and to look, then you're liable to be looked at. But what's so great about this photograph also is that it's a man looking at a woman. And you can be pretty sure, I think, I would argue, that she knows she's being looked at because she's looking straight ahead. Right? She's looking straight ahead because she cannot engage him. If she looks at him, that's an invitation for something more. Men White men, especially middle class white men, had the privilege of staring right, in the city. It was considered perfectly fine. Right? They also could do cat calls, but he's not doing a cat call. Right? Yeah. You talk about how urban living fostered a knowledge of not just people, but of places. How do these intersect in these photos, people in place? So people in place, this is Lower East Side, and that was one of the places where they took a good number of pictures. I'll, I'll show you another Lower East Side one. This is Hester Street. Um, and Saul Liebson, who was one of the founders of the Photo League, um, took this photograph and Again, it's, this is a great picture uh, because I'm going to open to where I can see it because I can't twist my neck. Um, because it shows all the different kinds of people as well as the place there. So what you get a sense of with, with Hester Street it is a recognition that New York is like set up for viewing, right? Um, to be able to, to look. Uh, you've got these different levels. You can stand on the stairs and, and have a sort of um, a slightly elevated view of what's happening around you. You can be coming up the stairs as that one guy is, where he's looking very, you know, up at the photographer. The photographer also intervenes, right? Because we see that this boy is like looking at him, say, hey, what, what you, what's so interesting about over there? He's looking at the photographer. That means that's how we see him. Or this other man who's really, he doesn't like the idea. And this photograph sort of 
also contravenes what was considered appropriate for photography. So Paul Strands was a very well-known photographer and taught at the Photo League. He, he told Liebson, you know, you got two photos there. You got the upper half, right, which is a really interesting photo where the people are, are in, in focus and stuff. And then you got the lower half where these people are moving and, uh, you know, and you can't have both. And Liebson said, no, you're wrong. The, the boy turning into it and the man walking is what makes the photo. Um, I have a, a, a little qu quote from what it is that, that Liebson said about that. Um, he said, I had a deep interest in the ordinary people who lived there then. And when I saw this group, I was overcome by another feeling I often have, that streets are often like stage settings. And sometimes you can catch people on those settings in very penetrating tableau. And I, I think he's, he's right. And that's a, it's a very penetrating tableau. I don't know if you can see there, but there's actually, in the um, optometrist shop, there's a man staring out. <laughs> Right? Um, oh, yes. Yes? Can you see? Yeah. 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 Next to the eye, and the, under the eye, there's Hebrew lettering, which is an indication of what the right. you know, yeah, thing is. When I see photographs like this, I think of the Ashcan artists uh, who precede yeah. these guys by 20 years they or do. more. They do. Did, did they have an influence on them? Do you have any sense of other artists that they looked at, or did they just generate this way of looking out of themselves? So, a couple of the photographers wanted to be artists. Liebson wanted to be an artist. Dan Wiener, um, I didn't bring any of his photos, wanted to be an artist. And he actually studied at the Art Students League. So in the Art Students League in the late 30s, he would have seen John Sloan paintings, yep. right? OK. Yep. I don't know that he actually studied sure. with Sloan. He turned to photography because he needed to make a living. Right? Um, and then he met his wife at the Photo League. I mean, Sandra, and they married. And so, you know, and then the war came, and he was in the Signal Corps uh, taking pictures. And by the time the war was over, he, he'd given up the artist piece, and he was a photographer. That was what he was. Um, so I just don't know. I, I mean, in the classes, uh, someone like, uh, Sid Grossman, who was a wonderful teacher, would send people, if they'd never been to a museum, they'd say, go to the Met, you know, take a look at, at, at the paintings, go, go to the modern. Um, they, the Photo League would sometimes get discount tickets and stuff. Um, he, he wanted his students, Sid Grossman did, to um, learn about art. But that was art broadly. It wasn't just the, um, you know, the Ashcan artists. Th these were some of these photographers were called Ashcan photographers hmm. too. You hmm. know. Are they selling any of this stuff? Are they putting on shows? Who sees these? They're pictures? putting on shows. They're putting on shows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where? Who goes to them? Well, the New School around here, they put on shows. Um, they would put on shows at the Y, various Ys around town. Um, when they did uh, photos of Harlem, they, they put on sh shows up there. Um, Chelsea document. They did collaborative wor work. That was another thing. It wasn't just individual. And then when the newspaper PM yeah. was yeah. Um, started, uh, that was an afternoon paper, PM, right? And it had photographs. And it had photographs where they gave credit to the photographers. And so a number of, I mean, Engel worked for PM, Leipzig worked for PM, Ouija, Ouija worked for yeah. PM, right, yeah. And so that was a place where they could be seen, yeah. Are many of these photographers women at all, or are they all men? Ah, no, 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 there are, there's a good number of women, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and let me see, we, we have a woman? Yeah, okay. So sh this is a, a wonderful woman. Um, uh, uh, Vivian Cherry, and she is someone who, tiny bit younger, um, uh, so she takes this photograph, she's in her early 20s, this is after, after the war, 
It's called Yorkville uh, Swastika. And she took a, a number of photos and of, of children playing. And she actually did work as a photojournalist. So, but she studied at, at the League. She was very uh, a left wing. And you know, here you have these kids engaged in um, uh, a somewhat violent game. Right? One guy's hitting the, the <laughs> other. What we did when I was a what? kid. <laughs> Yeah, okay, he's hitting, and the other one, you can see, has a gun in his hand, and the, the, the little kid with the, all his schoolwork, you sort of feel this, right, okay. And then, it, you know, this, it's, they all sort of tumble down that way. But she gives us the title Yorkville Swastika because she's political, and she wants you to pay attention not just to the kids, but also to that swastika, and that the swastika is in Yorkville, which was an area that was heavily German, and where the you know, German-American Bund gathered, and a little bit further north in Italian Har Harlem, you had you know, the, the Italian fascists also. Yeah. So uh, th there was a political resonance to um, these kinds of, of photographs. I, yeah. I was looking at this photograph today, yeah. and, it, and it strikes me there's a paradox. And it, this is a city where young Jews are out taking a place in the city through photography. They explore right. the city, they roam the city. But it's also a city with a degree of anti-Semitism, which when we look back on it is quite shocking, but at the time was considered part of everyday existence. Hey, how do these two fit together? Well, before I answer that, you know, the, the swastikas there, I mean, I remember yeah. growing up in New York with swastikas, right? And so, you know, you'd take a, a pen and you'd turn the swastika into a window, right? Um, and I did that. I defaced things that were already defaced, um, but it, it turned swastikas into, into windows. Um, and there, there actually are two of swastikas up in, in that photo. Okay, so the question about... It's also a city where young Jews are exploring it. They're claiming a place, right. as you write in the book. It's a very Jewish kind of city. How, yeah. how does this all fit together? What's the consequence of this? I think that for these young photographers, um, this was a way of making a claim on the city, um, that it was their city, even though there were whole industries in this city where Jews couldn't work, yeah. right? Yeah. You couldn't get yeah. jobs in communications or, or whatever. I mean, it, and yeah. Jews knew this uh, growing yeah. up. Yeah. But they also grew up in their own neighborhoods, which were much more Jewish, let's say, than the entire city. And the entire city at the, in these years was around 30% Jewish. So, you know, they're growing up in neighborhoods that were 60% Jewish. And uh, that was nurturing for them. And then you go out and, and you want to you want to claim that s s the whole city, not just not just your neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. you know, so you go to Yorkville, mm -hmm. um, and you take pictures. Did they ever look outside the Jewish community for subjects? Oh yeah, yeah this so is outside. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah, oh, oh most Yorkville. of the time. Yeah, I mean, okay, the, the East Side Suite, Evelyn, or the Hester Street, those are pictures uh, uh, we can assume of Jews. Um, you know, we don't know exactly, but in Hester Street, I mean, it's, it's the Lower East Side. The optometrist has Hebrew lettering on it. You can assume that most of the people standing around there were, were Jews, right? If, if, we, if we went back to right, Hester Street, right? Uh, these, are, these are Jews in the late 30s on the Lower East Side. Um, uh, so you could see it as a kind of ethnographic mm -hmm. photograph if, if you wanted to. Or you could just see it, as many people would, as a photograph of working class mm -hmm. men and women. What fascinates me about some journalists' accounts of the Lower East Side in the late 19th, early 20th century, they'll write things, here are the rights of ancient Israel reaching back to the Middle Ages. Here are the ancient Italians with customs so foreign and strange. Right. But this is a neighborhood that's changing dramatically all the time. Yes. And they're the children of immigrants living that change. That's right. That's right. You know. Um, and I do, have, I do have some photos from the post-World War II period of the Italian festivals that mm -hmm. were down on the, um, the Lower East Side, in the Italian area. I didn't bring mm -hmm. any of those tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but yes, the, the neighborhood is changing rapidly, and I would assume that most of the people in this picture were born here mm -hmm. um, and are, mm -hmm. are growing up here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What did being Jewish mean to these photographers? Uh, <laughs> um, that's a tricky question. <laughs> Um, because it, it was, it was sort of. I think the best way to answer it is it meant that was who they were. They weren't going to reject it. Um, their politics grew out of their Jewishness, right? their left-wing politics. Um, their passion for certain kinds of photographs, to take photographs of people, eye-level view, right, the, of, the, of the real New York, I think they saw that also as Jewish. I would argue that, that this belongs in our understanding of Jewish culture. But if you were to ask them, you know, are they Jewish? Ugh, you know, they, they would shrug it off. You know, there were non-Jews who joined the Photo League. Okay? Um, but the Photo League was mostly Jewish. So that meant that if you were a non-Jew in the Photo League, you had to be really comfortable around yeah. Jews. Yeah. Right? Because you were, in a sense, in a minority. You were in a Jewish space. Um, w. Eugene Smith, who was definitely not Jewish, uh, was part of the Photo League. Huh. And he said, wow. They had the best debates in the photo league. And he's talking about this Jewish style of argumentation about what makes for a good photograph. What, you know, I mean, he loved it. Right? Uh, and, uh, and, and he recognized, you know, this was a Jewish space. Where he was very much part of it. Um, yeah, there. yeah. I was fascinated by one of the photos that we saved for tonight because it shows them looking at a definitely not Jewish subject, a character on a street corner. Why don't oh, we yeah, go yeah. to him? Let's, let's go to him. Okay. The soul of New York. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. He's definitely not Jewish, this soul of New York. But Stetner, as a Jewish photographer, chooses to photograph a black man, a well-dressed, really cool black guy right, on the corner of 23rd Street, and to call him the soul of New York because Stetner is Jewish. Right? Stetner has been in the military. He grows up in Brooklyn. He serves in the military. He spends part of time in Paris. When he comes back, um, he's in Paris for around four or five years in the late 40s, early 50s. When he comes back, he's really conscious of, of how New York is different, and this is how New York is different, right? Um, and that's why he calls it the soul of New York. There's a, there's a big debate um, uh, among uh, people who write about uh, these New York Jewish photographers, some who say, ah, they weren't really Jewish, they were left wing. Um, which the second half of the sentence is true, not the first. <laughs> they were left wing, right? Um, but they say that because that reflected how they saw themselves as, as really left wing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet, of course, they're not denying the, the Jewish piece of it there. Um, and being left wing, gave you certain ways of, of looking at the city, but being Jewish complicated those ways, right? And so it's really important to see that this person, he is not in Harlem. He is not in a neighborhood that is identified with blacks. He is not someone who is suffering, right? Um, dressed like that, he's probably well employed. There's that sense of, of well-being around it. In retrospect, they, they, they're young in one kind of New York and old in a very different kind of New York, right? Their lives and their careers start in the Great Depression by the yes. time you get to the yes. 60s and after. The, yeah. Yeah. What does that mean to them and their work as that transition is lived out? So that's really hard, you know, because the New York Photo League 
closes in 51. Mm -hmm. It's put on the attorney general's list in 47, December 47, and um, although they do their best to try to um, convince people that they are not a political uh, subversive organization, uh, it, it just, uh, it, it doesn't work. Um, Grossman, who was one of the activists there, he leaves the League um, because of this politics. Um, and so what happens in the 50s is that there's no real substitute for what the Photo League was, but there is a gallery and coffee house in the village near Sheridan Square called the Limelight, and started by a woman. And she had taken a class with, with Grossman and decided, no, she can't be a photographer, not a Jewish woman. But she, she was passionate about photography. And so the coffee house exhibit space combo became sort of what happens in, in the 50s for many of the uh, photo league people who uh, couldn't get jobs in uh, photography because of their politics, or they moved into fashion, because mm -hmm. fashion, photography, nobody cared about politics. Well, you take pictures of models and hats and you know clothes and whatever, yeah. yeah. That's really, really interesting. So there's a, there's a change mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that occurs. Do they continue to live in the city yes. over these years? Yes, they mm -hmm. continue to live in the city. How, what do they think of the changes around the city by the time you're getting, but they're getting older, the city's They're in the getting place, older, the, the city's getting older. Yeah, a number of them die. Um, yeah. uh, Grossman dies in, in the mid-50s. Um, wow. Dan Wiener dies in 59. Um, m several of the women, like Vivian Cherry, um, get married and have a kid. And that sort of puts an end to taking photographs. Mm -hmm. Lepkoff is also married. She has several children. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it depends on, on, on whom you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of them try film, you know, mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. you know, motion pictures. One of the things that strikes me about them is their New York City is a pre-television New York City. Yes. It's a very gregarious city. That's and correct. And you have a great photo of Times Square, so why don't yeah, we yeah, yeah. look at it's that? It's a gregarious city, and it's also a city that not until the 50s did people talk on telephones, because roughly half of the population didn't have telephones. So if you wanted to talk to somebody other than who was in your apartment, you had to go out. And these, this is a great shot of these women. Um, Tell us going what's out. going on here. Okay, so you know, there's a one of the challenges of the book was how to organize, right? These these photographs, and I, I ended up deciding to um, use sort of broad categories. And this is in in the penultimate chapter, and it's called selling, because selling is what happens on the streets, right? And Esther Bubbly, who takes this. Um, Photograph. She too is an out of towner. Mm -hmm. uh, she grew up in in um, uh, Minnesota um, and, and Wisconsin, and she she comes to New York via uh, working for um, Roy Stryker in uh, the, FSA. the OWI. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, not the FSA. OWI. OWI yeah. okay. in in the third the early forty three and forty three, and then she follows him and he, he recruits her. So New York is all new to her, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not the city she grew up in. And what you see here is a kind of seduction of what selling is. I mean, he's selling, you know, hot chestnuts. Hot chestnuts are really great to eat. I used to love to eat hot chestnuts. Um, and he's convinced one woman she's got the package, right? And the other woman not so sure. But you also, they're all dressed so beautifully. And part of, of what's happening allows Bubbly to take the photograph because they're completely engaged and they don't notice her, right? Unlike, you know, let's say, with the Hester, Hester Street. Street. Right, yeah. right. They don't, they don't notice her. And she can't resist the sign, right? The, the um, edge of doom, 
the, the, uh, on the marquee. I mean, how can you resist that with that you've got this, I mean, that's what part of what makes the photograph, right? Is such a, the contrast of this lovely, intimate, you know, salesmanship that's occurring, um, and then the edge of doom behind them. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. These photographers are born and nurtured in the 1930s in right. a specific moment in New York City history. Yeah. That is well behind us today. Oh, yeah. What's worth extracting from that time to nurture good photography today? Is there, are there things that are worth photographers today could learn from them that you think are valuable? I think that, yes, I think that photographers today could um, pick up on the reciprocity that they really cared about. Um, the sense uh, uh, in, in which the photographer isn't just taking candidates and isn't just taking photographs for his or her or their own use, but that there's a, a kind of reciprocal relationship there. I think that um, photographers also Today, I mean, we, you know, there, of course there are still street photographers. Mm -hmm. And one of the current street photographers, Joel Meyerowitz, for example, has published about street photography. And he says that it's not an easy thing to do. I don't know if you've ever taken no, pictures. No, I was, I, yeah, I, I don't take pictures of people actually because okay. it's so hard. Right, it's really hard. Yeah. And I have, I have taught a course um, on modern Jewish photographers, and I, I, one of the assignments is that they have to pick, students have to pick a photographer and then try to take pictures in the same way. And when they go to try to take pictures of people, I get back after back after back. I mean, they can't come around to take them from the front. And that's, that's, a, that's hard. And to, to recognize that, that taking a photograph does involve not just the license to stare, which women got with this, right? So if we started with Engel and, and Sweet Evelyn mm -hmm. looking straight mm -hmm. ahead, if Sweet Evelyn had had a camera, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, as Helen Levitt did, as, as Vivian, you know, uh, Cherry had a camera, as Esther Bubbly had a camera, they had a license to stare yep. also, which was important. But they were also committed ultimately to understanding photography as in a reciprocal relationship. Does that license of stare in the long run play out with different ramifications for them as women? The guys could stare all the time. They, they could. They get to stare as photographers. Yeah, yeah, it does. Because women take pictures of kids a lot. And they take pictures of kids a lot because kids ignore women because you know they're like mothers. And so if you're out on the street, and most kids were out on the street because they didn't play at home because there was no room to play at home. So just like you couldn't talk on the phone right, at home, you had to go out in the street to talk. You had to, the kids were out playing on the street all the time. Right? So Yorkville swastika is a political little version of kids playing all the time out on the mm -hmm. street. So women took a lot of pictures of kids. Um, and it was uh, something that they did more than, more than men, usually. Um, that was one difference. Helen Levitt, whom I didn't That's, bring, yeah, yeah, yeah a, a photo of hers. She has some photos where it's clear the people looking back at her, like she has this one of a, a bunch of African-American men sitting on a, mm -hmm. and standing on a stoop. Um, that this is a, a very sort of risque thing to do, both for her as a, a what she would have encoded as a white, white woman, woman sure. right, um, f and for them to be looking back at her as a black man, mm -hmm. or black men actually, uh, there. So you know, th there's a you can sort of feel the tension in some of the, yeah. the photos yeah. there. We're going to move to Q and A soon, so start putting your questions down. <laughs> on a piece of index card, and then you'll hand them to one of my associates here, and then, and then we'll ask your questions of Deborah. Um, 
I'm struck, I've seen so many studies that talk about sort of the image of Jews in popular journalism, the image of Jews in fine art, the image of Jews, right. you know, in, 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 in literature. You chose to look at Jews as image makers. Yes. How and why did you make that choice? Well, I think that while scholars and others will look at Jewish writers um, or Jewish intellectuals um, and consider what they write or say as worthy of attention, yeah. um, we haven't spent enough time looking at Jewish yeah. <laughs> image makers yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in this field of photography. And this was a field where lots and lots of Jews went in, and not just in New York, but in Europe, and uh, you know, wherever Jews lived, Jews became photographers in the, the first half of the 20th century. Say more about that, why? Why they would why? do that, what the circumstances were for that. Okay, they go into photography because it's accessible, because it's mechanical, because you actually don't need to be trained. You can apprentice uh, because it's new and therefore there aren't barriers, right? There were a lot of barriers to becoming an artist, um, in getting accepted into art schools and stuff. So this brand new area, which wasn't taken particularly seriously as art, no. Um, no. was open. I mean, after all, anybody, you can all do it, right? You all do do it, I'm sure. You snap, right, you snap, right? Um, and take pictures. Uh, and the question is, of course, what do you choose to take a picture of? Um, and how good are your photos? <laughs> right. But that's, that's another issue. So Jews go into it in very, very large numbers. Um, and, you know, it, it's... It, it, it's something that uh, historians need to, to reckon with. Shake a stick. There are so many books about Jewish intellectuals who are writers. Right. <laughs> they're not hard to find. Right. And yet these guys are just as argumentative, it seems oh, they to me. Are, and definitely. they're in the same generation. Yes. And their work lasts as well. I mean, people still look at Helen Levitt's work. People still look at Ouija, right? Right. You named some of the more well-known people. Yeah. Uh, we put up people that, for the most part, I suspect, are, are not known, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Liebson, Cherry, even Bubbly, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. What, I mean, Ouija's the subject of a great biography that came out yes, recently. And I'm wondering, good, yeah. why is it that photographers like Ouija became more known than the folks that you've put up, who I think are very illuminating? Um, okay, so Ouija was a tabloid photographer. Yeah. He used very large, you know, camera yeah. uh, and flash all the yeah. time. He has, yeah. I have a, a photo in, in the book which is outside um, where the kids are, you know, a policeman is, is turning off a fire hydrant and the kids are wet. And it's clear from the light that he used a flash camera. Right? On a, and you know, it's like, what do you need a flash camera for when you've got bright sunlight? Uh, but, so Ouija becomes known because he covers um, uh, murders, as he would say, he covers um, the underbelly of yes. New York City. Yes. And these photographers were not interested in the underbelly. They, they really were interested in um, people who were, they, they may be poor, they, they, they were poor, they were working class, but they had real dignity. And there's very little photography that they took of, of um, drunks, of bums, of, you know, things, that's the language they would have used then, right? They didn't take those. Yeah. 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 They also didn't take rich people. Right. I, 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 I would call their photography, people. and I don't mean this to be pejorative in any sense, idealistic in a way that Ouija is not. Okay, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I, I think that's yeah. true. I mean, look, I have a whole chapter of the book on Coney Island, it's, it's called Letting sure. Go, and it begins with, uh, I'm just gonna assume many of you know Ouija's famous photograph of, of Coney Island with the, the every, it's packed, right? The, the, uh, um, the sand and everything. And how does he get that photograph? He gets up on a, um, <laughs> A, a lifeguard stand, and he starts waving around, right, and you know, and he, to get everybody to look at him, right, uh, and he, to take the photograph. 
these photographers, like Engel, for example, or, or Feinstein, um, they're down on the sand yeah. with everybody, yeah. right? So they don't take those kind of photo yeah. photographs, right? Yeah. They take very intimate ones uh, because they're among the people. These are their people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Okay. Did New York City street photography ever lead to policy changes relating to labor movements and other forms of activism? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's hard to know directly. There was a, um, a photo contest in the late 30s um, called One Third a Nation, mm -hmm. in which, uh, picking up on, on FDR's um, categorization of, of mm -hmm. the numbers of people who, who were, were suffering and, and in need of homes, and the photographers um, a number of them did engage with that and took photographs. So they took photographs yes. there, not just on the street, but also in um, tenements and uh, as in an effort to try to encourage um, uh, tenement reform or more public housing, that kind of thing. So this is really interesting because they're photographing tenements and the very housing that's going to get knocked down in right. some cases. So when they photograph tenements, what do they emphasize? What they stress? So they tend to emphasize um, family life in the tenement. Um, so there's a, um, well, I can't show it to you and you, you would not have seen. My colleague, I know, my colleague Sarah Blair has a book about um, the Lower East Side mm -hmm. photography and it, it's called um, How the Other Half Looks sort of building off of Jacob Reese's mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. title. And she talks about these, she has images in the book uh, of photographs that were taken inside tenements and you know, very peaceful, quiet yeah. kinds of photographs. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, this was to say, you know, this is not how people should necessarily be living, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, Question, did they ever shoot on color film? Ah, not in this time period, no color film in this time period um, that they used. The person who used color film was not connected with the photo league, it was a man named Saul Leiter. And he took wonderful color oh. photos. I have, I have one of his black and white photos, but he experimented, he, he was a painter and he took sort of, you know, color field painting that was pop, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. Mark Rothko and others in the, in the 50s. So he took photographs that often feel like color field paintings. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were slides. Uh, and um, recently, since his death, the, their, um, his estate and uh, two wonderful people working on bringing these materials, um, especially the slides, but his, a lot of his color photos mm -hmm. uh, into print. So, so mm -hmm. lighter is L-E-I-T-E-R. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there other Jewish photographers outside this circle working in New York City in these years? Can you say something about that? Oh, yes. That? So those of you who know photography will notice that I didn't mention Diane Arbus, for example, who was a photographer oh. working at this time. Um, but to go back to my original story about getting permission right, to reproduce right. things, so um, I, I didn't even try because I had tried once before to get permission to reproduce Diane Arbus and the answer was no. There's no Robert Frank, this another very famous mm -hmm. photographer mm -hmm. um, working at this time. So, you know, th these are photographers where their relatives were very generous and they really deserve a, you know, a shout out for saying yes, you know, you may um, reproduce these photographs. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, I think what we're getting here is a, a vision of New York City as seen not by the most famous, but by people who really, I think, made a difference and let us see the city through their eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quick question from someone. 
Are you familiar with, are they familiar with Daniel Nova, a union photographer in this time? Ooh, what's Daniel that? Nova come up at all? No, but um, Grossman taught at um, uh, District 65. Mm -hmm. He taught photography there. Um, and one of the, the photographers, N.J. Jaffe, took a course with him at, uh, 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 at, not at the Photo League, but at, at District 65. And I have Jaffe's photos here. The effort was to try to um, let union workers, right? I mean, the, the, pick up cameras and take photos uh, of all kinds of, of events that were going on and that they would then publish it in, in union publications. Uh, it was mostly successful. There's a book out, I'm not going to remember the names of the people, um, on um, f uh, picturing New York. It's, it's workers in New York, mm -hmm. and it has a whole bunch of these union photographs. How do they compare there. to what they're doing? These are workers. So these are workers. Right? So the workers were, were not as trained. Right, mm -hmm. um, and didn't spend their days <laughs> taking pictures. Uh, most of these photographers, you know, especially since a lot of them started out young, um, would would spend a lot of time on the streets taking photographs. If you're employed as a worker, um, you know, you don't have that much free time. I have one guy here, Lou Bernstein, who worked in. in well, he worked in what became Willoughby's um, and, you know, knew the, the industry from that side, you know, provide what kind of chemicals you needed, what paper you needed and stuff. And he, he could work only, you know, on Sundays when Willoughby's was closed then. And so you need, you need time to keep taking lots of pictures in order to get yeah. better yeah. at it. I have a couple more questions. The audience has a couple more questions, yeah. but we only have a few more minutes. Oh, okay. Let me ask you one very quick one, yeah. and then you can close with reading. What do you want readers to take away from this book? If they're students of photography, if they're New Yorkers or photographers, what do you want them to take away from this? I would love um, readers of the book to find real pleasure in immersing themselves in these photographs, to come to appreciate the photographers who took them, um, to gain a sense of New York and what it was like then, um, and also to see the world through these Jewish photographers' eyes. Yeah. Can you okay. read us a paragraph? I'm going to read you a paragraph, right. It's from near the beginning. So, Jewish street photographers shared the experience of maturing during the Great Depression, a repertory for interacting with non-Jews, and politics that leaned distinctly leftward. Most graduated from high school, some from college. Both were free in New York City. Educated by the city's public schools, they were not children of privilege. Several lost their fathers when young through death or desertion. A few of the women lost their mothers to death or depression. Mm -hmm. Informed by their working class experiences, they came to share a social aesthetic of photography. What types of photographs were worth taking? Under what circumstances should one take or not take a picture? These street photographers weren't drawn to New York as Gotham or Metropolis, the magnificent cityscape that spoke so powerfully to Abbott. They focused instead on working class people in their own neighborhoods where they lived, worked, and relaxed. As street photographers, they pictured public spaces, mostly outdoors, occasionally indoors in cafeterias and waiting rooms. In the process, they produced a distinctive portrait of the city based on eye-level interactions and attuned to stories that unfolded daily on the streets. Walkers in the city with cameras, they presented a Jewish vision of New York, a place they claimed as their hometown. 
This book invites readers to walk the streets of mid-20th century New York City during the decades when it was a working class and, in its politics and culture, pace and style, a Jewish town. Thank you. Thanks. So out Thank in the you. lobby, we have refreshments and even more important books to buy. Buy the book. I assure you, you will love reading it, and it makes a great gift. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming.